Hello and welcome to Evacor Healthcare's educational webinar series. My name is Bill Cornelius with Evacor. Evacor empowers the improvement of care by connecting patients, providers, and health plans with intelligent evidence-based solutions to enable better outcomes. If you would like to learn more about Evacor, please reach out to sales at evacor.com for more information. Throughout 2021, Evacor will host free educational webinars that include guest speakers, as well as Evacor subject matter experts to discuss today's most pressing healthcare topics. Stay tuned for our future webinars with new topics presented each month. Before we begin, just a quick reminder to please submit your questions using the Q&A feature in WebEx. Jenny will help us facilitate incoming questions. This presentation will be recorded and available following the webinar at evacorecom slash insights. And now I will turn it over to Jenny Ritchie, Vice President of Evernorth Home Solutions to give a brief introduction. Thank you, Bill. As an organization, Evacor has been particularly interested in solving for the dramatic shift to home, further emphasized by the recent COVID pandemic. As a result of that, we have combined forces with a larger enterprise to create new home solutions offerings. And now it is my privilege to introduce you to our presenter, Miriam Snitzer Taub. Miriam is the Director of Ecosystem Research at the Advisory Board. In her role, she leads research on a variety of topics that impact all sectors of the healthcare industry. Her current focus is the future of home-based care. Today, Miriam will take a closer look at the rising popularity of home-based care and what that likely portends for the future of our healthcare system. Miriam, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you, Bill. Thank you to the entire Evacor team for having me today. Um, I'm, I'm so thrilled to, to be with you all um, to share what we have learned here at Advisory Board um, about home-based care. I will say this is really the beginning um, of our research, you know, really diving deep into this area as we've seen so much interest in it. Um, driven not only by the pandemic, but by other forces as well that, that we'll certainly touch on. And so my hope today is to give you a little bit of a glimpse into what we're thinking about as the future of home-based care. Where is the industry going? What are the types of models that we think uh, are most likely to succeed, that are most likely to grow? Uh, and and what should really the industry be looking at, be thinking about to be sure that home-based care becomes a really great care opportunity for everyone? Um, as was mentioned, you've know, got the Q&A box open. Feel free to, to drop some questions in there as you have them. Um, we will do our best to, to get to some of them. Um, I know, but we also do want to make sure we end the, the presentation promptly. Um, so be aware if we don't get to your question, um, um, it's not that it wasn't a good one, it's just that we want to make sure we get you to your next meeting on time. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's jump into it and talk a little bit about where what home-based care is uh, and where it's going. So what, what actually do we do we mean by home-based care? Let's let's start with that. Um, home-based care is, is an interesting term, right? It is sort of this umbrella term for a whole host of healthcare services that we can do in a patient's home. Um, and we often think about home-based care by tying it to sort of the traditional care setting. And so that's what I have up here on the slides. You can see on the left kind of our traditional healthcare care settings and over on the right, um, the models of home-based care that currently exist or are being developed. And there's a really big range, right? It starts from, you know, our kind of traditional Medicare certified home health, the post-acute care program that has um, been in place for quite some time um, and, and also goes to things like home-based primary care and home infusion as, um, you know, ways to replace in-person outpatient care. Uh, we can think about hospital at home, which of course is, is, a, is a model that's gained a lot of uh, notoriety over the last several months uh, where we're providing acute care in a patient's home through things like personal care, remote visits. So there's a lot that to, uh, to really think about under this home-based care umbrella. And I'm sure you all can probably think of a number of other bullets we could add to this slide as well. 
I start with this emphasis up here because um, we're going to talk about home-based care a lot today, kind of as this sort of overall umbrella. Um, but a couple of times you'll hear me talk about the nuances that exist model by model. Um, and so let's keep that in mind because there are certainly are differences that exist when we start to unpack home-based care a little bit. Who really, you know, gets care at home? Well, who is the ideal patient for home-based care? What it really comes down to actually is there is no one single ideal patient, um, but what we see across a lot of home-based care models are some common characteristics for patients. Um, Home-based care has become increasingly uh, popular and, and something that we're really thinking about for the senior population. Um, you know, often if you look at models, they are built around uh, the Medicare population to um, allow those patients to uh, age in place and receive care at home. Uh, they often, you know, these the these models can care for patients with really diverse care needs, um, you know, ranging from kind of ongoing chronic conditions, recovering uh, from a procedure, receiving acute care. You know, there's a so there's a lot of different care needs. Um, and one of the key things that we often see in home based care is a difficulty for the patient to leave home. Now, that can be um, because of their living arrangements. It could be transportation issues, um, could be any number of things, but often um, patients are drawn to home-based care and providers look to home-based care for their patients uh, because they realize that it could be difficult for that patient to get to a facility and thus it's you know potentially uh, easier for them to receive care in their home and you can see at the bottom of the slide here just a handful of the evaluation questions that we hear providers and others thinking about when it comes to home-based care you know these are the types of questions that everyone needs to be thinking about to be sure that home-based care is the right choice for the patient. Because certainly what we know is while home-based care can be a really great option, it's not always the option that's best for a particular patient and their, and their family um, and their living situation. So why have we been sort of so focused on home-based care? What has driven um, this real interest in expanding home-based care, getting it to reach more people? Um, there are a whole number of things, but but one of the reasons that I think that we're all so focused about this is home-based care really does have that sort of elusive quadruple aim potential, right? Home-based care can do a number of things. Uh, we know that it can be a patient satisfier because patients, particularly since the pandemic, really do prefer to receive care in their homes. Um, we know that it has often has high um, outcomes, uh, sometimes better health outcomes than in a facility. Uh, clinicians like home-based care often because they can see the potential for a model where they have lower panel sizes. Um, they see the opportunities to potentially relieve facility or hospital capacity. And finally, there is the goal and the potential to reduce overall spending um, as the home can be a lower cost site of care. Um, so there really is this exciting potential for home-based care um, in, in achieving this quadruple aim. And you can see over on the right of this slide just a handful of statistics that sort of help to kind of illustrate that point. So no surprise then, um, if we have this goal in mind that we've seen really across the year, a number of key stakeholders kind of coalescing around this idea that the home is the next site of care shift. And so we see that from kind of all of the different stakeholders that you see here on the slide, uh, you know, starting with policymakers. Uh, so we'll touch more on the Choose Home Act in a few slides, um, but certainly there has been some legislation around um, kind of expanding services that can be performed in the home. Certainly we saw CMS uh, relax the hospital at home restrictions and really open up that program to many, many more hospitals to participate. We've seen provider organizations respond to that flexibility um, and think about how to grow their program. So you can see that the example that I'm highlighting here um, is, you know, Kaiser and Mayo investing into Medically Home as an organization, um, really thinking about kind of how, you know, they can be a part of building out some of this home-based care. We've seen health plans get into the game. You know, certainly if you look at what some of the major health plans are doing, they are they are acquiring and investing in parts of the business that will help build up home-based care as part of their assets. Um, and we've also seen some really interesting moves from kind of the big tech, big retail um, angle as well uh, for folks who've been following the news um, sometime last month that, you know, in October, 
Best Buy announced that they were acquiring Current Health um, as part of their ongoing um, moves to kind of build and uh, build their home-based care platform. Um, and we saw Amazon join the, the Moving Health Home Coalition, um, really sort of advocating for, um, you know, more opportunities to provide care at home. So we really see this kind of across the industry, you got a wave of, of organizations really interested in building home-based care and expanding services uh, to patients in their home. What does this all come down to? If you remember nothing else from my presentation today, I hope you keep in mind kind of these three things. These are our three insights into where we see the future of home-based care going. And we'll start to kind of talk through these a little bit more as we move through the presentation. So first, uh, Home-based care will demand for home-based care is going to grow, um, and in no small part due to the aging population that has higher acuity needs. Um, we know that the population of seniors in this country is large and is growing, and we also know that there are large parts of that population that have one, maybe multiple chronic diseases. We also know that seniors increasingly want to age in their homes. And all because of that, um, it's going to push the development of programs that help them receive care in their home, as opposed to the sort of default option being going to a facility for care. The second thing I want to point out is that the long-term adoption of home-based care models is very, very closely tied to the adoption of value-based care. Uh, because what we see so often is that many of the home-based care models, at least those that currently exist, just aren't feasible long-term unless you're under some kind of risk-based model. And we don't see them really being compatible with fee-for-service. And so what we're likely to see is organizations that are more invested in risk models look more at investing in some of these home-based care models. And finally, uh, there's a lot of talk about the importance of stability and reimbursement in home-based care, and that is certainly an important aspect. But I would push everyone here today to remember that um, reimbursement is not the cure-all, that there are a number of other challenges inherent to providing care in patients' homes that the industry really needs to overcome together if we're going to really realize that quadruple aim and the potential for home-based care. So keep these three things in mind as we move through the, the presentation. Um, and, and again, these are kind of where we're really seeing the future going. So if we think about the future, what does it hold? Uh, I think what a lot of the industry is thinking about is that there are kind of two directions for home-based care. I think we can all agree that home-based care is likely to grow. I think we're past the point of wondering if it happens or not. I think the question is to what extent. So on the left, we've got a limited growth path, right? We've got, you know, everyone sort of working in isolation, jockeying for position. We're probably not going to have a really coordinated approach. And so the end result is going to be care that expands somewhat, probably just to patients that historically have had really good access to care um, and probably not in a, in a large enough way to really see true transformative change. On the right, we have the alternative, which is this high growth path. Um, to get there, we would need industry stakeholders to really take this deliberate approach, partnering as necessary, really maximizing their own value. Um, and what we would see here is that this coordinated approach is going to help us overcome some of the key challenges around home-based care. And as a result, we will get home-based care to a larger patient population greater numbers and more likely have sort of a true sustainable impact on healthcare. So we probably all want to get to the, the vision on the right, I'm assuming, um, this idea of high growth of coordinated care, um, of really you know, getting home-based care into the homes of those patients um, who need and want it. So how do we get there? Well, our minds are first going to go to reimbursement, right? You know, I think there has been a lot of discussion about um, the fact that, um, you know, reimbursement in home-based care at the moment is very piecemeal. There are certainly some programs that have reimbursement structures set up. There are some that have, um, you know, some, some sort of temporary, temporary structures, and there are others that we're still really figuring it out. And historically, we've often reimbursed or funded home-based care through pilot programs, right? There have been a number of different pilots to test out these models, and those are great. The problem is those pilots end, and then there's no real path to moving them forward. 
potentially grants, maybe some startups, you know, all of this has contributed to a really piecemeal approach to home-based care. What we would need if we really want to think about a sustained rise and growth then is really investment in the infrastructure that's needed. We really need to think about what is the reimbursement and the coverage model that fits across the different types of services being offered in the home. And what we also need is for providers who offer home-based care services, whether they are health systems, uh, you know, physician groups or others, to think about um, how, where does home-based care fit within their organization to not have it be an afterthought over to the side, but to really have it be incorporated within their larger strategy. And that's really how we can sort of solve the funding problem that at least gets us, you know, that one step closer to that higher growth model that we were just talking about. If we look then, again, we've been talking about home-based care as this big kind of umbrella. I, I want to take a moment to sort of look, break it down into the models and to think a little bit more about kind of where this growth might come. Because I do think it's important to note that, you know, though we see growth in home-based care, we do think that the growth opportunities are different depending on the type of service that's being offered. Um, and so we have this here, you know, roughly bucketed into the kind of different outlooks that exist for some of these services. And again, this is not um, every type of service that can be offered in the home, but it, it's hopefully a helpful framework to think about opportunities. We'll start at the bottom and work our way up. So Medicare certified home health has a very stable reimbursement structure, um, a very stable program structure, which is great and, and allows for it to be a really stable program. Because of that, though, there's probably not a tremendous amount of growth that we're likely to see in the Medicare certified home health area, barring some kind of large wholesale program change. So very steady, some growth, but, but likely to be limited. When we move up to the second category here, um, here we have services, things like home infusion, dialysis, mobile urgent care, virtual visits, where we're starting to establish a reimbursement structure. It might not be fully widespread. It might not be, um, you know, you know, fully figured out, but there are some, some uh, criteria and other things in place to start, you know, thinking about the parameters of these types of programs. You know, these are procedures um, and service areas that we do expect growth in the home, particularly as that payment and reimbursement models do start to stabilize, as patient demand grows, as patients become more comfortable with the idea of you know, receiving infusion or dialysis services in their home, um, as clinicians are looking to it as well. I'll also note that this category does contain um, a you know, volumes that are quite high, right? If we just think about simply the number of dialysis procedures that could ship to the home, um, it's a very high volume. And so, there, you know, it, it is important to keep in mind that, you know, this is a place where we could see kind of large numbers of movement of procedures shifting to home, um, again, as these things stabilize. And then at the top, we have, um, you know, certainly the types of home-based care that is receiving a lot of news, things like hospital at home, SNF, you know, skilled nursing facility at home, and home-based primary care. We could put home-based specialty care there as well. These programs, you know, some of them have been around for a while, but many of them have limited reimbursement models currently, you know, with the exception of some pilots, um, certain risk-based models that payers have put into place. So for these types of procedures, you know, the jury's a little bit still out. There's a good amount of potential volatility here. We could see a large amount of growth for these types of services if this reimbursement stabilizes, if we have some coordinated solutions. We could also see sort of stagnant or even declines if the opposite happens. So real opportunity for these ones, but you know, certainly a little bit more volatility than that second category where we do expect kind of a steady growth. So we spend a lot of time on this slide, um, but I do think, again, it's important to sort of start to unpack a little bit what this idea of home-based care means um, to start to understand kind of the individual services that fit in. Now, people often ask kind of, you know, are there going to be sort of large uh, funding boosts for home-based care, kind of legislative changes um, that might impact the reimbursement landscape? Couple of things that we've been tracking. 
Um, one is, you know, the potential for additional funding uh, to be sort of poured into home-based care. Uh, back in April, President Biden proposed a $400 billion investment in what's called home and community-based care. Um, as um, the congressional Democrats have been, you know, thinking through what ends up in their domestic spending package, that number has been changing a lot, is likely to end up quite a bit smaller than $400 billion. Um, but certainly we're still watching to see what ends up in that final package. So there may be some amount of funding that comes there. We're also looking at, you know, is are there legislative solutions that expand service offerings? Um, so uh, over the summer in July, the uh, there was legislation introduced called the Choose Home Care Act, um, which would create an add-on payment for home health to care for patients that right now are only eligible for nursing home level care. This is really what would help operationalize this idea of sniff at home um, by kind of providing that payment structure there. So some opportunities that are certainly there. There's a lot of complexity for folks who follow the politics here. You've probably been seeing a lot of this um, that that are playing into what may or may not end up happening. Uh, you know, for one, there is some tension about whether we should be investing more money in home-based care or more money in facility-based care, particularly, you know, facility-based care for seniors. So there certainly is some tension there. Um, there's a lot of priorities that congressional Democrats are thinking about um, and wrestling with about what should be included in spending bills. And there are also a lot of things that fall under home and community-based care. So time will tell a little bit in terms of you know, what might end up, you know, this year and beyond. But there are conversations happening, you know, at the, the federal level about how to expand some of these services. So overall, I would say, as I mentioned, we're past the point where, you know, we can say that home-based care, we're not sure if it's going to grow. We do think home-based care is going to grow, but I would argue that the pace of change is likely to be slower than some of the headlines have suggested. You know, without this sort of large-scale financial, regulatory, legislative change, what we're likely to see is a more gradual shift of care to the home um, as all of the pieces fall into place. So let's imagine a world uh, where we've solved this funding challenge, right? We've figured out this stable reimbursement. Um, you know, we've got that figured out. Um, you know, we have the, the money needed to pay for some of this care. I would argue that that doesn't solve all of the challenges uh, because I think what the industry needs to do is start to wrestle with well, how do we solve some of these challenges that are here on this slide. Um, there are some real important uh, elements to providing care at home that I think honestly are sometimes overlooked when we talk about the promise of home-based care. So here's the part of the presentation where I potentially temper expectations a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about all of the things that could potentially go wrong. Um, and I do this not to scare people off or to give the impression that I think that home-based care um, isn't achievable, but because I think it's really important to understand these challenges up front. Uh, because I think where we've seen success in home-based care, it is with organizations who have thought about these ideas at the beginning and have put into place programs that proactively address them. So we're going to talk through the six uh, challenges here on this slide. Um, I will say again, we're going to talk about home-based care as that sort of big umbrella, because I think these challenges are universal to home-based care, though the specific impact might differ a bit um, by the particular model. Some of these may have more of an impact than others. But let's walk through them. We're going to start with, um, I would say, probably the, the biggest one, right, which is um, how do we ensure that home-based care doesn't reinforce the existing equity issues that we know are already inherent in this country in the way that we provide healthcare. Certainly home-based care, you know, requires stable housing. Um, it can often necessitate out-of-pocket investments by patients. Um, sometimes these services are not available to patients that live in rural areas. Uh, they often rely on technology that may or may not be available to particular patients. And if that's the model of home-based care that we go with, um, I think the industry is really going to, to really start exacerbating some of the inequities that already exist. 
Um, and I say this because we have some historical data to back this up. We have seen um, in care that happens in the home already that there have been um, barriers to care, particularly from for people of color. You can see over on the right this slide. Um, you know, people of color already um, have lower likelihood of seeing of receiving a visit when they've been discharged to home health from the hospital. So this is all uh, an existing issue that the healthcare industry needs to wrestle with, right? How do we ensure that this doesn't become a site of care just for the wealthy who are able to receive care in their home, but it is a site of care uh, that helps to address some of the some of the inequities that we already see in our our healthcare system. So I start with this one uh, because I think it's critically important. Um, I think it is something that everyone who's considering expanding home-based care, investing in home-based care, uh, building a home-based care structure should be really thinking about. I think the other big uh, challenge that I don't know gets as much attention, and it's a little, um, it's in some ways very different from equity issues, but it's this idea of logistics. Um, and when we think about the logistics involved in home-based care, we often run to sort of the clinical logistics, right? Um, and those are important. But I would also argue that there are non-clinical logistics that are just as crucial. So think about all the things that exist in a healthcare facility so that when a patient comes in, everything's ready for them, whether that's supplies, whether that's equipment, whether that's the outlets in the right places, um, whether that's the people and the medication there at the same time, all of that now needs to be replicated in the patient's home. And this can be challenging, right? We have a lot of moving pieces. How do you ensure that um, you know, all vendors are, are in alignment to get the equipment to the patient's home um, before a clinician arrives to deliver some part of care? Um, how do you ensure that the home has sufficient space um, so that when that equipment is delivered, the outlet is where it needs to be, um, that there is the um, internet or self-service available, that patients have the food that they need. There are a lot of these logistics that start to come into place. And certainly when I've talked to organizations that have you know, said they wanna put into place, let's say a hospital at home program, one of the things they've called out is, you know, a challenge is that their uh, DME vendor maybe only runs from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So if they want to um, admit a patient to their hospital at home program after 6 p.m., they need to figure out how are they gonna get the equipment to that patient's home before the next day. So, you know, these are some real interesting um, differences from when we're giving care in a patient's home to when we're uh, to when we're tra traditionally delivering it in a facility. I think the other thing to note here, as you see on the right, uh, is that, you know, patients want to receive care at home um, and they're willing to make some changes to their home, but they're not willing to make really drastic changes to facilitate home based care. So this is the result of a consumer survey that we did earlier this year, and you can see um, that you know more than a third of the folks who responded said that you know they're not willing to move into a new home to allow them to age in place. You know they're not willing to move into a family member's home or move closer to family. Um, they don't want to have to ha ask someone to live to move in with them to help with care. Um, and so these are important things to keep in mind because I think the industry can't just assume that patients can kind of take care of this in order to facilitate home-based care. The next challenge I want to touch on um, is one that, you know, certainly exists outside of home-based care, but I think when we look at the way in which the home-based care space is really growing with new uh, folks entering all the time, I think it becomes really critical. And that's the idea of care coordination. I think it's really critical that home-based care thinks about, you know, how do we ensure a standardization for how the industry triages patients, how care plans are communicated, um, how every stakeholder that's interacting with the patient gets what they need um, in order to ensure that the patient um, has a, a good experience within home-based care and one that contributes to good outcomes. 
Um, and we often think about this, you know, why the industry needs to do it. But, but one of the things that, you know, we did was we, we said, okay, well, what does this look like for a patient? And you can see that over there on the right of the slide. Um, you know, what does care fragmentation show up as if you're a patient? It, it probably shows up as confusion, right? Why am I getting a different recommendation than what my, from my home care provider than what my, you know, PCP has told me? Who should I listen to? You know, it might show up as as frustration with delays, right? You know, why are, you know why didn't my medical records move? Why does my PCP not know what happened with this program, or vice versa? Um, or it might honestly show up as as um, anger. You know, why why was I even why was I told to be a part of this program? You know, if I don't have the right supports, if 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 the things aren't showing up when they need to be, and so there are real. Um, sort of, you know, challenges that come and that show up in the eyes of a patient when the healthcare industry can't properly coordinate care in the home. When I talk to uh, folks that are interested in home-based care, whether they've already implemented programs or whether they're considering it, I would say this challenge is the one that we want to talk about the most and that is workforce challenges. Um, you know, when I've talked to organizations that have, you know, implemented a hospital at home program um, and, you know, I ask them, are you interested to grow it? They often will reply, will reply, yes, but I don't have the staff right now. There are, you know, huge challenges with workforce shortages that exist both in facility-based care and in home-based care. You know, this is really an industry-wide challenge. Uh, and so, you know, home-based care models that then talk about lower panel sizes where um, folks are having to travel from you know home to home while that can be great that can also really exacerbate this shortage even more um, and again uh, not really create an opportunity for these programs to grow uh, I think if we think about, um, you know, the, you know, the, the sort of staff that often are going into a patient's home, this is a population that historically has had very high turnover uh, that can um, often receive high, higher hourly salaries, better benefits, potentially a better working environment in non-healthcare positions. Um, this is a, a workforce that, particularly coming out of the pandemic, um, has a lot of burnout, has low engagement, potentially is fearful of their safety. Uh, and so there are some really ongoing reasons about why this workforce shortage is happening. Um, and I also think, you know, there's a there's a, a point that we can look at some of the demographic changes um, that are happening in this country that are creating some of these supply shortages, especially if we're thinking about kind of experienced RNs. Uh, folks have been following the news about sort of the wave of resignations um, within healthcare. I think we can say, you know, this is potentially going to get worse before it gets better. So what I'm really looking for, um, and I'm always interested in, is how does the industry come together to overcome this workforce shortage. There's a role for technology. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Uh, but I think there's also a, a role for organizations to think about how do they retain and engage the staff that they have? What are some potential creative ways to partner to grow the workforce? Uh, because I do think it's this, this workforce component that's going to be so critical to growing home-based care. We've talked about the workforce and on the previous slide, I think, you know, we were talking about kind of the workforce at large, but but largely um, focused on nurses, home care providers. Um, physicians are an important part of this puzzle as well. Um, they're an important piece of the care team, of course. And any time you're introducing a new model, um, we're introducing challenges for physicians. And I think that's important to recognize, right? Home-based care often is asking physicians to change the very well-established care models that they have. Sometimes it's asking them to include a third-party care provider um, that's you know supposed to work alongside in tandem with them to provide care in the home. And that can lead to really valid concerns from physicians about the quality of care that their patients are going to receive, about continuity of care. Um, I will note that if it's successful, home-based care can be a truly physician satisfier. You know, I've talked to a number of physicians who will say that they think home-based care is the best thing that's happened to their career as a physician. Um, I've also talked to those 
that are very skeptical um, and have a lot of the questions that you see on the right of the slide wondering, um, you know, how are they going to be updated? You know, who's going to be taking care of the patient? Um, who decides whether this patient's well suited at home? How will I, as the physician who's known this patient, how do I know that this patient's going to be well cared for? Um, and who's going to loop me in if something is going wrong? Uh, and so I think, you know, I think there's this real importance of engaging physicians throughout this process of thinking about where it makes sense uh, for physicians to uh, be engaged directly with patients, how they can coordinate with others who are providing care in the home to ensure that what we see with home-based care is that physician satisfier and not another, yet another source of frustration for physicians. And the final piece of the puzzle, and again, I finish with this one that I think is not talked about as much as it probably should be, and that is caring for the caregivers. I would say nearly every type of home-based care program places some kind of burden on patients' personal caregiver, caregivers, whether that's family, close friends, you know, folks that they're hiring. Uh, and so it's really important to think about how do how does the industry support these individuals, because often it's the presence of these personal caregivers. It's the work that they are doing that is so critical to patient success in the home. Um, we know that the the generation of of uh, that is sort of both often taking care of children and taking care of elderly family members. We sometimes call this the sandwich generation. We know that this is growing. Um, we know that for many of these people, they have been asked and often have made personal sacrifices due to the financial costs of caregiving, whether that is leaving employment, whether that is you know, changing their financial situation. Um, and this can lead to caregiver burnout. Um, and if uh, we don't have well-supported caregivers, it's very hard to have home-based care that's going to be successful for patients. Um, because again, we're sort of, uh, we're asking these caregivers to take on some of the role. And so I think, you know, organizations that are, are thinking about how do I ensure that the caregiver is well-supported, that they have the information that they need, that they know who to call if something's going wrong, um, that you know, they have resources, that they're, they're sort of connected to all the right resources. I think it's really critically important to start engaging personal caregivers more as we think about moving more and more care to the home. So we've talked through this challenge, through all of these challenges. Um, one of the questions that, that I'm often asked is, you know, what about technology? Can't technology solve these challenges? We have so much technology available to us, so much that we can do in our homes. Um, you know, isn't this the answer? And I think it is maybe. I think there are absolutely amazing opportunities for technology to aid in home-based care. And you can see that list over on the left. I think, you know, we can use technology to identify patients uh, who are likely to be successful at home. You can use these predictive analytics to, to identify who might be at risk of deteriorating. You know, certainly all of the telehealth technology that we've developed, uh, you know, we can reduce the need for in-person visits. We can monitor patients, whether that's through wearables, whether that's through, um, you know, technology that will automatically communicate readings to providers, you know, we might have bio stickers sometime soon, you know, we can certainly use technology to do a whole host of things. But technology is not alone a savior. It can also lead to additional challenges, some of which I've listed over on the right. Um, I think important to note that all of the algorithms are great. Uh, but if we don't evaluate those algorithms for bias, what we might find out is algorithms hurt more than they help. Um, also important to remember the digital inequities that exist in our country today that really limit the utilization of technology by patients in their home. Um, if you start adding lots of different devices to a patient's home, what you might end up with is a lot of different information that might not be integrated in the EHR, um, and that's going to lead to more care fragmentation. And then also, I think it's important to note that all of these technologies require a lot of training. Um, you need to make sure providers are trained, caregivers are trained, uh, patients are trained, that there is the idea of what they do if it doesn't work. Um, so I think technology has this real promise. Um, and I'm so intrigued and excited every time I read about some sort of new type of technology that is enabling more care in the home. Um, but what I'm also really always looking for is how are we evaluating it? 
Um, how is it interacting with other technology? How is it being easy to use um, so that we avoid that list over on the right? Solving all of these challenges then, as you might have guessed, is not something that any entity within healthcare can do alone. I truly think that to solve that wheel of challenges that I showed a few slides ago requires a multi-stakeholder approach where we have home-based care providers, health plans, supplier partners, each coming together, kind of contributing the piece of the puzzle that they do best and working together to create home-based care um, that uh, gets, gets over some of those challenges. And so we can truly grow it and scale it and get it to all of the patients that it's needed. And what that often comes down to is thinking about success built around patients. Um, as we've been doing this research over the last several months, we've asked every single person who we've spoken to, how do you define success in home-based care? We've gotten a lot of different answers, a really fascinating long list. Um, some people will point to specific metrics saying, you know, we define success in home-based care by lower readmission rates. Um, or we look to see, you know, a um, number of um, nights that a patient is able to spend at home versus in a healthcare facility. Other people will talk about, you know, engagement and satisfaction by patients and their families. Some people look at financial metrics. Um, you know, some people will look at, you know, of their total patient population, you know, how many of those patients could move to the home. There's lots of different ways to measure success. And I think all of those are valid. But what's really interesting is that almost every measure of success talks about the patient in the center of it. And that, I think, is so critical uh, because I think what we see is that if we think about that patient in their home at the center of home-based care and then consider how do you build the program around it that supports that patient, that supports their personal caregivers, then I think is that is how the industry gets to a really successful home-based care program that uh, really does achieve the potential and you know, potentially gets us closer to that quadruple AM that we talked about towards the beginning of the presentation. With that, that brings me to the end of what I wanted to share today. Um, I recognize I have taken us you know, nearly to the end of our time. Um, I know there have been some questions that have been um, asked uh, and I do appreciate that. So that I don't shortchange your questions, um, I think we're going to sort of wrap up the presentation here, um, but truly thank you all so, so much for joining. Thank you to Evacor again for asking me to be a part of the presentation. And I think Bill, I will turn it back over to you to close us out. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, thank you again for sharing your ex expert knowledge with us today. Uh, participants, thank you all for your attendance. Uh, this concludes the webinar. And again, the recording will be available on demand by visiting evacore.com. Please remember to register for our upcoming webinars. You will receive an email invitation with the opportunity to do so. If you would like to learn more about our capabilities, please reach out to sales at evacore.com. This concludes the webinar. Have a great day.